Florida right now, Pastor John. Uh, man, what a great church. What Greg, what is going on? Everyone that's in South Florida, I want to give a big shout out to you. I want to give a big shout out to Lincoln right now. What is up, everyone that's at Lincoln right now? Love you guys. By the way, we have a Lincoln meeting that's going on this Thursday. I'm going to see some of you guys there. I can't wait for that. Uh, anyway, this it was such a joy to have you. Everyone that's in traditions right now, it's great to have you guys joining us. By the way, we're gathered in the name of Jesus. And today, we're coming out of Breakthrough Weekend, which is these are on Breakthrough Weekends. Um, you get the chance to hear someone besides me preaching. I want to ask Mike Lane to come on up here. I want you to give some shout out to Pastor Mike. Pastor Mike is our youth pastor. And uh, this joker is about to preach the word of God with some boldness. And so I want you guys to welcome him. I want you guys to get ready for this. From South Florida to North Florida to Lincoln to Traditions, get your hearts ready for the word of God. Book of Joshua, get your souls ready. Mike, be used by Jesus. Amen. Amen. Love you, man. Hello? Hello? All right, you hear me. Hey, hey, go ahead and stand on your feet. We're going to go ahead and get started. Again, um, South Florida, welcome. Lincoln, welcome. So great to have you guys online with us. Uh, we are in a series called Strong, and I'm so excited to preach this word. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited to hear this word. And we're going to be talking about a lot of the things we hear. Last week, we talked about the deception and how to overcome it. This week, we're going to talk about how to actually overcome the traps of fear that sometimes we could be in. So if you go ahead and go to, uh, if you, come on somebody, I like that. I like that. So go ahead and go to Joshua 10, and we're going to read the first couple of verses. And it goes like this. As soon as Adonazadak, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, Doing to Ai and its king as it had done to Jer Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. He feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all of its men were warriors. So that word, Adonizadak, <laughs> king of Israel, sorry, king of Jerusalem, sent to Haom, king of Hebron, to Piram, king of Jermoth, to Jaffia, king of Lachish, and Deber, king of Eglon. Come on, this is, this is crazy. <laughs> Come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. And then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, and the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered their forces and went with all the armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war, a war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua the camp of Gilgad, saying, Do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went to Gilgad, and he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, and here's the key right here, Do not fear. Look at your neighbor and say, Do not fear. For I have given them into your hands, and not a man of them shall stand before you. Isn't that good news? That is great news, right? Let's pray, Jesus, help, especially when it comes to these words. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, go ahead and take a seat. In the biggest fight of Joshua's leadership so far. Today I want to talk about how to actually overcome what's in front of us. And it's not necessarily the battle at times. A lot of times it's our fear. You know, I'm not necessarily a boxer fan or a boxing match fan, but I do love boxing movies. Anyone love boxing movies, right? All right, I'm talking about like movies like Rocky, right? Right, Rocky, and most recently, one of my favorite movies has been this movie called Creed. Creed is amazing. I love it a lot, and I think my wife loves this movie so much because the main character actually resembles me, right? <laughs> Throw out this picture. So, he looks a lot like me, right? This, I know, I know. Now, listen, that's a lot of Photoshop, and ladies, I don't want your, I don't want your eyes to kind of get, you know, lusted. So let's go ahead and throw up the next picture. So just for the sake of this, go ahead and put up the next picture because I want to make sure, I want to make sure that you guys are okay with this, all right? Are you guys okay? Is that good? All right. And so if you don't know a lot about this movie, 
pretty much this is the story, kind of like the aftermath of what's going on uh, with Rocky, and this is Adonis' Creed's son, and pretty much the whole story is about a son trying to live in his father's shoes. Now, here's the thing. If you either watch boxing or watch boxing movies, one of the things are clear is there's, there, there's certain characters that come along with this story. So there's like four groups of people. The first group of people I would call like the fans, right? These are people that kind of go in, they, they look at a pay-per-view, they, they go to the matches, they're excited. The second group I would call the refs or uh, the announcers because sometimes, frankly, I am clueless about what's going on or what p punches are landing, but the, the refs and the announcers, they kind of help tell the story. The third, the third group would be uh, the fighters, right? These are like the ones that are actually in the match. They're the ones that everyone is paid to watch. But then the fourth group, the fourth group is the one that we don't necessarily talk about all the time, and this is who I would call the coach. Now here's the thing, the coach is really important because after every single round, the fighter comes to the corner, and this corner represents the place where the coach is giving instruction, he's giving strategy, he's, he's, he's providing identity, he's, he's giving them direction so that when the fighter goes back out, this fighter is going to be best and he's going to be able to you know, tackle the things that are in his life, right? He's going to be able to tackle uh, the strategy to take down the opponent. Here's what I need you to know right up front, is that every single one of us, every single one of us, we sit in a chair, we sit in a corner, and we have a coach. And the reason that matters is because the voices that we listen to, the voice that, that we listen to, we are only as strong as the voice or the coach that's in our corner. We are only as strong as the coach that is in our corner. The coaches in your life or the voices in your life will either be the death of you or the life of you, but they cannot be both. See, today we're talking about overcoming your fear and a key to overcoming your fear is having the right voice. See, the success of your battles, the success of you overcoming your fears depends on the voice you respond to. See, you are only as strong as the voice in your corner. Jesus makes this statement at the end of the Sermon on the Mount series where he gives these strategies, these heaven on earth strategies in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And the grand concluding statement in Matthew 7, Jesus tells this story. He tells this story about a house, right? He says the person that, that, that builds their house on the rock, the person that hears these words of mine, they put them to practice is like a, a, a man that, that builds his house on the rock. And when the storms come and the waves come, that house is going to be okay because they've listened to my instructions. See, you are only as strong as the voice you listen to. And it's no surprise the secret ingredient today, what I'm asking for us all to do is I'm asking for you to allow the king of the universe to sit or even to coach you as you sit in the seat. So you are only as strong as the voice that is in your corner. So here's the big idea today. Because we know the coach gives us great instruction, what I'm asking for you to do is as you sit in this seat, I'm asking for you to take what God has said and to use it as your weapon. Take the words that God is revelating to you and use them as your weapon. Take the words that the coach encourages you in between the rounds of your life and use it as your weapon. Why? Because when God is your coach, when you put God in the game, you will win every single time. So how do we do this? Number one is we got to meditate on what God has said. Meditate on what God has said. Throw this picture up. This is a picture of this celebration. How many of you guys have ever had a moment like that, right? You know, as a youth pastor, I get a chance to go and visit people a lot, and I get a chance to go to a lot of games. And, and one of the things I love is when one of my kids, he scores the winning basket. Isn't that a good feeling, right? A little kid that's down on himself, he really doesn't know what, what, what to expect, and then all of a sudden he, he shoots the final shot, wins the game, and he's excited. I think all of us have had moments like that, right? Maybe, uh, maybe it's the, the, moment, the moment when we're going out and we're bowling and we bowl a strike and it's that awkward moment because we bowl a strike and we want all the validation, but then we don't want to act like it's a big deal, right? <laughs> we like kind of turn around, do the slow turn. Hey guys, right? 
But man, what I notice when I'm watching the basketball game, I'm watching a game and one of my kids, they, they, they hit the winning shot. What I notice is that every single time they take the slowest walk to the locker room. They even sometimes turn around. It's like, man, like the locker room was there. It's like, yeah, I know, I'm just walking here. And they, what they, what they want to do is they want to hear the validations over and over and over again. There are moments where you'll ask them and you say, hey, man, that was a good thing. He's like, hey, what, what did you say? It's like, hey, you're great. What did you say? You're great. <laughs> and I got to tell you, that's not, just, that's not just teenagers. That's all of us. And this is one of the reasons why we got to meditate on what God has said, because there's something in all of us that craves validation. There's something in all of us where deep down we know that courage and strength and how we feel about being a hero in one moment is so leaky because the next moment we're, we're dealing with the same self we're, we're, we're dealing with the same issues. See, we are only as strong as the voice in our corner. And what I need you to know is that there's this, this, this moment for us where we, we crave validation, we, curse, we, we crave strength, and, and it only lasts for moments. It's leaky because we are only as strong as we remember we are strong. We are only as strong as we remember we are strong. And this is the theme of Joshua. And this is what I love about Joshua because every single milestone, every single bump along the way, Joshua's fear or even obstacle is met with God's promises. Like when we look at Joshua 1, it starts off this passage where, where Joshua gets this, the, the, the nation of Israel gets this big news like, hey, listen, my, Moses, my servant is dead. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do, nation of Israel? What are we going to do? God, you promised that you're going to allow Moses to lead us into the promised land. What are we going to do? We're super nervous. We don't know where to go. But yet God meets Joshua and the people with a promise. He says, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, go back. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Go down a little bit further. He says this to Joshua. He says, every place that the sole of your foot would tread, I have given you, just as I promised. The next thing we see, we see this moment where they're crossing the Jordan River. And it's super nervous, nerve-wracking and and I bet as he's sitting in this chair, he's like, man, coach, I don't, I don't know what to do because this seems very impossible. God, I, 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 is this something that you can do in me? I, I noticed that you did this with Moses before. I remember that Red Sea moment, but God, do I have enough leadership potential in me to get this through? Do I have enough leadership potential to get this across? Yet, God gives him a promise in Joshua 3, 7, it says this, it says, the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. See, God is, a, he is someone that we can listen to. He's a coach we can put in our corner. What about this next moment where we see Jericho, this big nation, one of the first battles that they would fight, and all of a sudden there's this big wall, and, it's, and it seems impenetrable, and it seems like, uh, like they can't step across that, and they can't, they can't overcome that battle, yet, jo yet God tells Joshua in, in Joshua 6, 2, he says this, he says, and the Lord said to Joshua, see that I have given Jericho into your hands, and with his king, the mighty men of valor. See, man, it's, it's, it's something about meditating on what God has said. See, see, the good news I need you to know today, based on what we're seeing here, is that on the other side of fear is a promise that God gives us to get us through. I don't know what you've been going through. I don't know what your situation looks like. I don't know what, what fear is trapping you. Listen, I need you to know this, is that on the other side of fear, on the other side of trusting God is a promise that God gives us to get us through. Maybe you're struggling and you're like, man, God, I, I don't, I'm struggling with my knees. Philippians 4.19 says this, it says, and my God will meet all of my needs according to the glorious riches that are in Christ Jesus. Maybe it's sickness, man, you go to Isaiah, man, by his stripes we are healed. Maybe you need wisdom in Proverbs 3. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Breakthrough. Man, maybe, maybe you're in this chair and other weekends you've been, you've been listening to the wrong voice, you've been listening to the wrong coach. And this weekend you know you made some hard decisions to follow Jesus. 
and you know that maybe there's people in your family, there are mothers and fathers or uncles or cousins or boyfriend, girlfriends that aren't gonna acknowledge this decision or accept this decision. This is what I need you to hear here. In Psalms 27, it says, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. See, see, meditate on what God has said. What has God said to Joshua? He tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. My question today is, what has God told you? And that church, that South Florida and Lincoln, that is a treasure that is worth digging for. See, I, I want to cause you to, to get in God's word, to see in scripture, God, like this is what you're saying. This is what you've been saying about my life. This is what you've been saying about my dreams. See, you want to take those things. You got to take that, what God has said, and you got to use it as your weapon. See, meditate on what God has said. John Piper says this the best. He says there's moments, there's ideas, there's There's things in scripture that at times you're not clear about or you haven't fully embraced or you haven't fully seen and you're like, God, like you say this, but but I don't know. The trick is not for us to completely ignore what God's scripture says. The trick in what John Piper would say, he says, hey, you need to take those truths and you gotta beat it into your heart and you gotta keep beating it into your heart. Online, you gotta keep beating it into your heart until it becomes true to you. See, that's the way we look at scripture. If there's things that are going into your life, get into scripture. You beat it into your heart. You beat it into your heart. You meditate. You meditate. You're like someone in Psalms, you're like the man in, in Psalms 1 who, who meditates day and night. And he's like a, a guy that is planted by streams of living water. Like you just beat it into your heart until it becomes true. Because you take what God says and you use it as a weapon. But what I also understand is it's not enough to focus on what God has said. Number two, you gotta activate what God is saying. See, point number one, meditate on what God has said. Number two, with the coach, you gotta activate what God is saying. Yeah. Think about this, like, a, like if you're in a boxing match and you have a coach that's been preparing you along the way, it's not enough to just get coaching in the ring before the match. You need some ongoing coaching. You need some ongoing encouragement. You need some ongoing leadership. See, what I love about Joshua is that Joshua isn't just meditating on what God has said. He's constantly making a place to hear what God is saying. See, you got to activate what God is saying. And how comforting it is in the biggest battle of Joshua's leadership so far, how comforting are the words of verse 8 where it says, Do not fear them. Just think about that on time. Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hand, and not a man of them shall stand before you. What is God saying? What is God saying? Because he's always doing something. What is, what is God saying? Because he's always doing something new. The question is, are you taking time to listen? See, it's not enough to only take coaching advice from the past, but we need play-by-play advice in the present. And it's our temptation. It's our temptation. Even some of us that have been in the church for 20 years that are disciples, it's so tempting to just rely on what God has said. But the next ingredient, the next step is getting along with God and saying, God, I hear what you said, but God, are you saying something new today? What is God saying? What is God saying? We see this in the book of Genesis. We see this with the stages of Abraham. We see this in Abraham. Abraham, God tells Abraham, like, hey, I'm going to give you a son, and you're going to name him Isaac, and you're going to establish a covenant with him. That's what God said. And then a few chapters later, he says, hey, take your son, your only son, and you're going to send him off as a sacrifice. That's what God said. But what is he saying now? When when Abraham makes his way and he's about to sacrifice his son, what does God say? He says, do not lay a hand on him. How dangerous it, how dangerous is it is as a church, as a body, as a disciple, when we aren't putting ourselves in position to hear what God is saying. We can't just rely on what God has said. We have to be disciples who get along with God and we say, God, what are you saying for my life today? See, activate what God is saying. Let me be honest with you. One of my biggest frustrations, even with myself, and this is me looking inward at myself, is knowing who God has created me to be, yet holding out from stepping out. 
I'll get along with God. He's like, man, Mike, like this is, this is who I've created you to be. Even before I was preaching today, I, I'm in worship and God is like, hey, listen, Mike, this is who I've created you to be. Yet there's a fear in me that wants to hold back. There's a fear in me that wants to stop advancing into what God has given me or the authority or the spaces that he's telling me to go. There's a thing in me that wants to say, no, I quit God, but you got to activate what God is saying. See, the reality is I don't want to get to heaven and I get before Jesus and he says, son, this is, this is all the things that you've done in your life. But over here, here are all the things that you could have done. Mike, you, you did okay. You tried your best, but there was some coaching advice that you missed. There were some moments where you missed hearing my voice, and if you would have heard my voice, if you would have separated yourself to get away from the drama, to get away from the things that are in your life, if you would have got along with me, you would have heard exactly what I was saying, and you could have did this. See, this desire in me, and I know it's desiring you for your life to count. See, some of you are called to start nonprofits, and you've been holding off. Some of you are, are future church planners or future worship leaders or radical givers. My challenge for you is to follow the God-given dream that he's placed in your life. As you're, as you're sitting in, in this chair, would you, would you listen to the coach that says, hey, I am with you. You can do all things through me. I am not forsaking you. I will not let up on you. Will you hear, will you activate what he's saying? Because that's exactly what Joshua has done. I need you to know the one who holds the heavens and the earth within his hands can hold your fears too. The one who holds the heavens and the earth within his hands can hold your doubts too, can hold your sickness too, can hold your worry and your anxiety too. See, we have a big God. And what makes Joshua so ready for this task is that he's looking at God as he should. He's measuring God as great as he is. And he's able to activate what he's saying. Dads, man, single moms in the room, we got to do this for our family. What if, what if once a month, as you got along with God, you're meditating on what God has said and you're activating what he's saying and you got your family together. And you say, guys, listen, as a family, I've got great news. I've got the, the best news. God, he says for this next season for our family, he says to go for it. <laughs> guys, I need, I need you to know, daughter, son, I need you to know, the Lord is saying, go for it. He's saying, be strong. Or maybe there's seasons where you're supposed to wait. He said, guys, in this season, I feel like the Lord is saying for our family to wait. To wait, to hear, to get alone. And that's what we're going to do. Can you imagine a son going to school and he's trying out for something or he's, he's stepping out in some way and all of a sudden he hears his daddy's voice. The Lord said, go for it. You know, there are some of us that are in here that, that a lot of times the reason why we can't believe God for, for who he is and what he wants to do in our life, a lot of times is because of our past mistakes. Some of us in here, we make leadership mistakes. We're not perfect. We made parental mistakes, mistakes in our marriages. My challenge for you is to get alone and, and get in the word to see what God is saying. See, what I love about Joshua is that there was mistakes that he made in Joshua 9 with the Gibeonites, trusting the Gibeonites, leading, to that, leading into that deception. But God is a really good God. And what's great is that God, that Joshua in, in, in chapter 9, he repents and he ultimately makes his mistake work in his favor. See, God is really good at taking your mistakes and using it for his greatest blessings. Isn't that true? God is so great at looking at your failures and saying, hey, listen, I'm going to take your failures and I'm going to make it to just do some amazing things. What's great about this moment is that Joshua's mistake in, 
in Joshua 9, the Gibeonites joined forces, and that makes a lot of people mad. That made a lot of kingdoms mad. And so check out how good God is. Instead of Joshua and, and his army having to go and fight five separate battles, God takes that mistake and he brings all five battles to him. <laughs> See, God is really great. Listen to me. You made a mistake. God is really great at taking that mistake and using it to advance his glory. You've blown it. You're tempted to put yourself in time out to say, God, I'm sorry, you can't use me. Listen to me, walk in his grace. What is God saying now? Breakthrough. Man, I love breakthrough. I remember, man, in 2010, spring, I, my mom and, and, and my dad and my wife's mom and dad, they came out, we came together. And I remember that moment. Listen, you made a commitment to follow Jesus, act on his promise. See, it's not enough to, to, to know that you're a new creation if you still act in old ways. It's not enough for you to know that you're adopted, that you're part of God's family if you still feel like an orphan. There's, it's not enough to know that greater is he that is in me than he is in the world than for us to lean on the one that's in the world. See, there's something in you where you need to activate what God is saying for your life now. See, Joshua, he activated what God said by marching on to his next obstacle. Joshua gathers the troops, the troops and they march throughout the night. And this route being very difficult, it's an up, uphill trek to Gilgad, from Gilgad to Gibeon. I can just imagine the silence. I can imagine Joshua being so consumed in his fears. You know what I do when I, when I find myself consumed in my fears? I get in God's word. But then I also listen to worship music. <laughs> I start to find songs that tune into the faith I need to attain or the, the way I need to step out. I can imagine Joshua in this moment surrounded in his fears, surrounded in his doubts, but yet confident on what God has said. I can imagine, I can imagine him just, just beginning to worship. I bet you Joshua probably put on some Thai tribute. And he's marching, he's like, man, if he did it before, he'll do it again. Same God back then. Same God right now. I bet you that was building his faith. <laughs> I bet you along the way he decided to put on some, some Sinatra. And he's like, way maker, miracle worker. I don't know why I always add an accent when I sing it. <laughs> Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Maybe he put up some Tasha Cobb, because <laughs> you know you can't go anywhere without listening to some Tasha, right? And maybe we got to this point, it's like, man, not by might, not by power, by your spirit, God, seeing your spirit, God. And then there's that moment where you want to get real hype, right? You know, you, know, you, you, know, you, you get full of faith, you're like, okay, I got to go do this. You got to listen, listen to something like rockerish, <laughs> like something back in the day, like early 2000s. And so you're walking, all you hear is da 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 Travis Green, and I bet you there's moments where, where Joshua is recounting how faithful God was. And he's looking at Joshua 1, God, you did this. And he's looking at the Jericho River, and he's like, God, you did that. And he's looking, I'm mean, sorry, he's looking at Jordan River, and he said, God, you did this. And he's looking at Jericho, and he's like, God, you did this. Yeah. Yeah. I bet you reach this point where even one of my favorite songs, where Travis Green is like, man, you move mountains. You cause walls to fall by your power. 
We see miracles, and there is nothing that's impossible. Cause I'm standing here only because you made a way. But isn't that our God? See, there's something in us that has to meditate on what God has done. And we got to activate what God is doing. And the overflow of that is point number three is to ask. It's to ask. I can imagine, I can imagine Joshua as he's approaching this battle. I can imagine Joshua getting along with his guys. He's like, guys, I got great news for you. I met with the king. I met with the coach. I sat in the chair. I listened to the right voice. I stayed, I was patient, I waited to hear, and God gave me great news. He says, this battle that we're gonna fight, we're gonna overcome it. He says, this battle that we're gonna fight, not a man of them is going to stand. So be strong and courageous. Can you imagine him getting with his people? Guys, great news, we got the victory. (laughs) Guys, great news. We're going to be standing there at the end only because of what God has done. God's great news, we have a champion that's going before us. And the overflow of that gives us the ability to ask. See, I want to challenge you as we end today. If you have the audacity to ask, God has the ability to perform. God has the ability to perform. Now, audacity, it sounds like a... It sounds like a cockiness, but I need you to know like this biblical audacity is believing God for the impossible. And so this is what it says. It, it picks up in here. It says, and, and so Joshua came upon them in verse 9, suddenly having marched all night from Gilgad, and the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a mighty blow, and Gibeon, and chased them by the way of ascent to Beth Horm, and struck them as far as Azekah and Makeda. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down to the Cenobeth Horn, the Lord threw large stones from heaven on them as far as Ezekiel, and they died. And there were more of them who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. See, I think what God is saying is this. God is saying, hey, listen, ask me because I'm the one who ultimately fights your battles. Ask. Look at your neighbor say, ask. Ask. <laughs> Because Joshua makes this thing. He says, after Joshua seeing all of that, he says, at, the, at that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in a day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, son, stand still. Sun, stand still. Moon, stop. And it says the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their, en- on their enemies. What, what caused Joshua to make such a bold ask? You know, I, I think that there is this moment in Joshua's life and his leadership where he got in the chair and he was listening to the coach's instructions so much that at some point Joshua just believed God. God God got along with Joshua. Joshua got in his chair and he he began to realize that that Joshua Joshua could trust him. That that God is not a man that, that he should lie. God is dependable. And he took, as he was sitting in his chair, he takes God's promises and he begins to use it as his weapon. And here's what I, as I was looking at the scripture, I think that Joshua reached a place where he believed God enough that whatever stood in the way of what God has promised, 
he had the authority to knock down. Listen to me. Joshua believed. God, you promised that at the end of the day, not a man of them was going to be standing. You promised me that I was going to have victory. You promised that you were going to be with me. And now I see the sun is starting to go down. I know when the sun goes down that the enemy is going to be more likely to retreat. But God, you promised me. You promised. And because of that, the thing that stands in my way is darkness. So what am I going to ask? I'm going to ask the sun to stand still. See, if you have the audacity to ask, God has the ability to perform. What do you need to ask for this morning? What if, what if instead of speaking to our issues or about our issues, what if we decided to speak to our issues? It's, it's, so, it's so tempting for us to, to gossip or to get around and say, God, you would never do that or this seems impossible. What, what if we got a good look at our God and we say, God, I'm no longer going to speak about, but now I'm going to speak to. And it reminds me of this, this woman with a bleeding issue that for 12 years of her life, she was dealing with something that she thought was going to be a lifelong issue. She thought that, that man, there's nothing that I can do. She went to all the doctors. She, went, she visited all this, and she spent all this money, and, and nothing happened. But then she saw Jesus. And it's, instead of speaking about her issues, instead of, instead of complaining all the time, she chose to, in that moment, as Jesus was making her way through, she chose to speak to. And she would chase after Jesus, and Jesus would make her whole. Here's what I want to do. If you've got a welcome card or, or a piece of paper, the way I want to end it is I, I just want you to make an audacious ask. There are some things that God wants to do in your life right now. There's some worry and anxiety that God wants to cancel right now. There are some of you that are sick. There are people that you know that are sick, have cancer, have things that, that man cannot treat, but it's not impossible for God. So if you have the audacity to ask, God has the ability to perform. So we're going to go back into worship. I have my wife come out and she's going to lead us into worship. And I don't want you to stand. What I want you to do is, is dads, single moms, leaders of the household, college students, I want you to get along with God just for a minute. And I want you to meditate on what he said. I want you to activate what he's saying. And I just want you to ask. And maybe that might mean you getting together with your family and saying, guys, like for this season, this is what the Lord is saying. And then once you, you're done with that, I just want you to stand and respond and we're gonna end like that.